Welcome to this Asia Global podcast, brought to you by the Asia Global Institute at the University of Hong Kong. I'm your host, Alejandro Reyes, the Institute's Director of Knowledge Dissemination. In our programs here in Hong Kong and online, and in the content that we produce, we focus on presenting Asian perspectives on global issues. This podcast is part of our Meet the Author series, where we have a conversation with contributors to Asia Global Online and other publications of the Institute. Joining me now from Los Angeles, California, is Sufal Ir, Associate Professor of Diplomacy and World Affairs at Con Occidental College. He is the author of Aid Dependence in Cambodia, how Foreign Assistance Undermines Democracy, published by Columbia University Press, and co-author with Siegfried Burgos of The Hungry Dragon, How China's Resource Quest is Reshaping the World, published by Rockledge. His next book is on viral sovereignty and the political economy of pandemics, what explains how countries deal with outbreaks. Very timely book, uh, but we'll get to that later. So far, welcome to this Asia Global podcast. Thank you, Alejandro. Very nice to see you. Now, in your article that is trending on Asia Global Online, the Institute's digital journal, you and your co-author, uh, Jafet Kitson, write about Cambodia's dependency on China, which is the biggest investor in the country, foreign or domestic. Cambodia is part of the Chinese Belt and Road Infrastructure Development Initiative. Now, as the West is sort of punishing Phnom Penh for human rights viol violations and backsliding in democracy, China has been forging stronger ties with the country. Now, the two nations have announced the conclusion of a free trade agreement. So you and Jafet outlined the economic benefits that the Chinese have brought to this ASEAN member nation, which is now a low middle income country. The government of Prime Minister Hun Sen, who has been in power since 1985, is counting on China to help it handle the immediate task of post-pandemic recovery and to overcome longer term structural challenges for the economy which you outlined. Now, my question is this, and because it's a question you pose in, in your article, is whether this dependency that has formed, this dependency relationship will be profitable and sustainable. Will it be profitable and sustainable? Well, I certainly hope for the Cambodian people that it will offer more than it has in the past, which has tended to be casinos, um, a lot of uh, condos, luxury condos that Cambodians don't normally live in, in any case. Of course, the land that it's built on has, has helped those who owned it, the Cambodians who owned it. Um, it has also, of course, brought some industry. I mean, the garment industry in Cambodia is the largest foreign exchange uh, contributor. Uh, and a lot of those garment factories are, are owned by ethnic Chinese, whether mainlanders or whether greater Chinese, uh, greater China uh, citizens, um, Singaporeans, Malaysians, etc. cetera. Uh, so, I mean, you know, one can see that the, the trend has been over the years to increase that relationship, to deepen that relationship between Cambodia and China. And it offers things for China as well. It offers the South China Sea in terms of support on ASEAN, uh, contradicting the position of the Philippines and Vietnam uh, by supporting China, as well as signing letters of support on the Uyghurs, uh, saying there's, there's nothing happening there, uh, things that are standard uh, uh, items that Beijing expects of countries that it supports heavily. And in Cambodia's case, it has, I think it's, it's had a special relationship with, with Cambodia for, for some time, uh, disproportionate for the size of the country. Now, but hasn't this close relationship, um, you mentioned some of the um, issues in Southeast Asia that are kind of connected to it, but the close relationship has really put it at odds with some other ASEAN members, hasn't it? It has. In fact, with Vietnam, uh, the fear of a naval a Chinese naval presence on Cambodian soil, for example, has alarmed uh, Hanoi. Um, 
after all, China, uh, Viet, Vietnam and China aren't exactly the best of friends. Uh, and so having Cambodia host any kind of military presence would be of, of great concern. Uh, there was a leaked memo or agreement uh, in the Wall Street Journal. They never actually had a copy of it, but they talked extensively about it mm -hmm. as though they had seen it, which clearly uh, under un underlined uh, the nature of that relationship. Passports for Chinese uh, officers, uh, Cambodian passports, which would essentially deputize them as Cambodian citizens and in theory not violate the Cambodian constitution, which says that there cannot be foreign troops on Cambodian soil. So if you're going to make them Cambodians, then perhaps you're interpreting the law very narrowly and saying, well, they're, they're Cambodians now. Of course, they're not actually fighting for Cambodia, they're fighting for China. And so the concern mm -hmm. by uh, Washington DC is that the flag that will fly at the Riem Naval Base will uh, in certainly in a portion of it will not be a Cambodian flag there. Um, as well in Koh Gong, there's a uh, mega project that appears to be uh, building a deep sea uh, water port and a runway that is the longest in all of Cambodia, far, far longer than seems necessary for the middle of the jungle. This base, I, uh, this, 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 this strip, this airstrip is for what exactly? What kind of planes would bring, uh, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of tourists in the middle of the jungle? That doesn't seem to add up. So there are strategic issues that are really coming up now. Um, you know, you've studied and you've taught about nation building and Cambodia, where you were born, is very much still a country that is rebounding, rebuilding, recovering from a very grim past. And we'll, we'll get to that later. But what can you tell us about the long term economic and sociopolitical challenges? So the on the ground reality that the country is facing now? I think the on the ground reality for Cambodia is still one where you have a country that lost a quarter of its population under the Khmer Rouge uh, in the 1970s, uh, mid to late 70s, my own father included and, and brother. Um, but you have basically a country that began from a very low base, uh, was very poor and actually one could argue was deprived of access for much of the for the 1980s when it aligned itself with Vietnam and the Soviet Union and this was sort of cut off um, by the West and uh, essentially from there after the end of the Cold War became a kind of democratic experiment in uh, in the UN peacekeeping and and UN organized elections and and simply had 25 years of relative democracy, which have now apparently ended because uh, the direction of the prime minister who has been in power for 35 years, Prime Minister Hun Sen, is simply that the country cannot either afford democracy or the rule of his party and of himself needs to continue without the challenge of democracy. Um, the growth has been impressive, I will say that. If you're only looking at GDP growth, I think 98 to uh, 2007 was something on the order of close to 10%. After that, it's been 7%. So some of the fastest growing uh, uh, performance uh, out there in 2019, it was the 11th fastest growing country. Uh, so if one cares only about dollar signs and not how they're distributed, of course, that looks very impressive. But if the reality on the ground, as you were asking, Alejandro, is that people are still desperately poor. The uh, maldistribution of income has, has led to, I think, a bifurcation in society of, of, of Bentley riding, literally, uh, Bugatti Veyron uh, owning, uh, you know, 0.01 percenters. And then you've got a thin middle class, and then you've got a large, large number of people. Of course, depends on where you put the poverty line. If you put the poverty line too low, it looks like poverty is decreasing. But the reality is, uh, if you expect people to live on a dollar a day in Phnom Penh, they're not really living at that point. Now, you've written also about dependency and how economies that 
might uh, become dependent, too dependent on uh, development aid and assistance and how this affects democratic development or how it affects democracy or the quality of democracy in these polities. Um, how, how do you see that in, 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 in Cambodia specifically, but it, I guess in general, because you, you've looked at other, other right. countries in this situation? Well, I, I certainly, I would say that the effect of aid dependency and, and you know, when I originally wrote about it in reference to Cambodia and, and really other countries, um, was in the sense of official development assistance, ODA. But of course, that's shifted now towards the idea that actually Chinese foreign assistance is the same kind of uh, dependency causing relationship that, that we've observed. Uh, and, that, and that is, of course, one where, you know, if a country doesn't need to collect tax revenues uh, and relies on, on foreign sources of income, it doesn't need to then listen to its people. So the motto of Washington DC is taxation without representation. If one looks at uh, what's happening in places like Cambodia, it's really no taxation means no representation. So there- No there, accountability. No yeah. accountability. Yes. That the, the, the link in the democratic state is one where if you're going to tax me, I'm going to demand accountability from you. I'm going to demand that your, the money that I pay through my vote is taken seriously and that you're not simply going to spend willy nilly and, and, and enrich yourself and rob me blind. But of course, if instead the authorities decide that actually we're just gonna not really take as much money from you, of course, the reality is they're taking plenty. They're taking it from unofficial taxation, which is, of course, euphemism for bribes and corruption, then you add all of that up. And it's as much as any developed country. The problem is that they're not getting the services in return. They're, they're, they're being told that officially this is only how much we collected. And therefore, this is what kind of government you deserve as a result. Um, that, unfortunately, is totally inadequate. And uh, and means that uh, the accountability link for democracy is severed. What does this uh, tell us about, or what, what do you think it tells us about uh, the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative? Uh, particularly when people talk about, you know, debt trap diplomacy and those things. And, 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 and indeed, you know, if you go to Sihanoukville, I mean, Sihanoukville has been, in, uh, as I understand it, sort of transformed because it's kind of the focal point in, uh, Cambodia of the BRI. Right, yes. And, and I think the BRI is, is the supercharging of that uh, aid, a foreign assistance relationship. Of course, it is through loans, so that we're not talking about grants where there's not going to be anything owed at the end of the project. Of course, there's going to be debt uh, accumulated. And and that's, that's, the, that's a, a driving concern when you have a lot, of, um, a lot of debt, can the commercial activity that is created as a result of that be adequate to pay for the uh, debt servicing? And we've seen in Hambantota Port, uh, Sri Lanka, that you know, the port was built commercially uh, dubious in terms of, uh, of, of ability to generate the revenue required, then handed to China for 99 years and subsequently with requests to have submarine visits and other things that are very military in nature. Would Cambodia be in a similar situation? Well, with casinos, uh, certainly the, the problem there is crime. The problem is uh, money laundering and Cambodia has ended up already on this gray list for the uh, uh, money, traf money laundering and, and trafficking task force. Clearly, uh, I think uh, a problem uh, for a country that uses dollars, so it makes it very easy to bring in suitcases of money and uh, plunk it into a condo and say, okay, well, this is your investment and now you have a title to it and, and nobody can take it from you and nobody's asking, know your customers, any of those things that other countries, developed countries, would be asking about, you know, mm. where'd you get your money from? How, how did you come up with millions of dollars all of a sudden? Yeah, no, interesting. Now, now 
as I mentioned, you were born in Cambodia and your journey from Phnom Penh to Los Angeles, I think most people would agree, uh, has been epic. It starts in 1975 when the Khmer Rouge take o uh, took over. You know, this anti-society group that aimed to reset Cambodia, disrupt and change everything from you know, the name of the country to the way of life. Uh, I'm wondering if you could just sort of tell us a, a, a bit about this sort of epic journey um, that really your mother was the one who, who guided you and your siblings uh, from uh, Cambodia to Vietnam to France and then to the United States. Sure, absolutely. I mean, it is, it is really a miracle uh, what she did. And uh, I mean, I was too young to remember it, but, you know, family narratives are what they are. She told me and I was able to learn as a result the, the story of our family. I was born in 1974. It's not clear uh, the precise date. A lot of Cambodians have no idea when they were actually born. There were no uh, records kept or records were destroyed. Um, but I believe it was end of 74, perhaps even early 75. And of course, the Khmer Rouge, as you mentioned, took power in April uh, 17th, uh, 1975. And they dispersed our family. We were uh, a bourgeois family, if you can call it that, uh, uh, well off, uh, living in a mansion, whatnot, and sent into the countryside. And, and uh, the, the only reason why I'm alive today and I have four kids is because of my mother's actions. She was able to um, use language to uh, cross the border, uh, to essentially trick her way through. So one day the, the Khmer Rouge cadres, uh, commune chief said, um, you know, the Vietnamese government, then already communist, would like its citizens back. And this was early 75 uh, into the, uh, the Khmer Rouge uh, takeover. So it wasn't yet when the Khmer Rouge were attacking Vietnam, uh, their communist brothers yet. And so it seemed reasonable uh, for us to, for my mother, after discussing it with my father to say that, that um, you know, we should give it a try. And so they put their names down. Now my father is ethnically Chinese, didn't speak any Vietnamese. Uh, he, I don't know what the idea was exactly, but he would never have passed uh, had he been tested. And so uh, I don't want to say fortuitously, but it happens that three days into their journey towards the testing site, he passes away from malnutrition and dysentery. So uh, one issue that would have come up uh, is essentially taken off the table. My mother then with five kids takes us to the first uh, uh, site, is tested by the Vietnamese. Now her Vietnamese is terrible. She doesn't actually speak it as would a Vietnamese person. She learned it from friends uh, back when she was a little girl. She spoke it in markets and so on. And so she had, being allegedly Vietnamese, had given everyone new names, Vietnamese names, but her Vietnamese was so bad, she gave the boys girls names and the girls boys names. And so, it, it was going to be discovered until uh, a nice auntie, basically, Vietnamese auntie, who was also testing, said, oh, you might want to change it, and did three days of, of intensive drill sergeant lessons uh, in a private uh, uh, area of the camp uh, that allowed my mother to improve her Vietnamese to the point where she, she, she did pass twice, uh, one exam under the Khmer Rouge and one under the, the, the Vietnamese uh, uh, cadres themselves, the communist Vietnamese cadres. And then even, even having passed, we end up in a village uh, or in Hong Nu, Vietnam, where you're not, you're, you're not told that you, you can just be free then. After all, this is communist yeah. Vietnam. So you're told that if you can't find family to come get you, to come claim you, they will send you to the new economic life, which is basically communism in the countryside, of maybe Khmer Rouge life uh, in light uh, and uh, fortuitously in the market one day on, in the one week period she had, she met an, a lady who was, who she knew, who then sent word to my aunt who did live in, in Ho Chi Minh City, formerly Saigon, who then sent her husband to come get us and he bribed the guards at night to get us out and bring us to, um, to Ho Chi Minh City uh, and to start 
another life. Now, of course, Vietnam being communist, she knew that there was no future there for us. I mean, not a meaningful future. We, we would be alive, that would be one thing, but we wouldn't be able to, to, to thrive. And so figuring out a way to go from Vietnam outside was the next step. I had an aunt in the US who wanted us to ultimately be in the US, but there was no relationship anymore, no diplomatic relations between Hanoi and Washington DC. And so it ended up being um, France because France did still maintain diplomatic relations. And a uh, cousin in France who was tasked with the job of getting us over to France, he wasn't even related in the sense of same last name or anything like that. So he couldn't even help us on that front. And he was on top of everything, a starving student. So he had no resources, but a Frenchman helped and got, uh, I don't know, he took on the cause of the Ear family the, and, and he, he filled out the paperwork, he demanded accountability from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in France and then got... And in fact, uh, you became Cambodian again, as it were, right? Because that's, right. that was the way to get so out. The first thing she did, my mother was so smart about this. So yes. right after lying about being Vietnamese, she arrives in Vietnam and immediately says that we're Cambodian because there's no way to leave Vietnam unless you're actually not Vietnamese because yes. why would you have all these boat people trying to get out of Vietnam because they couldn't legally leave Vietnam, communist Vietnam. They had to get on a boat and try their luck out in the middle of the ocean. We being Cambodian could then take a plane and leave Vietnam because they didn't care about Cambodians leaving. Of course, they wanted their bribes and uh, my mother said she, she paid left and right, but you know, at least the bribes could work as opposed to the, uh, the fact that essentially, um, if you were the wrong citizenship at that point in Vietnam, you couldn't get out. It was your communist heaven and you needed to stay there. Now, um, you eventually got to France, as I, as I understand yes, it. So I, then, was, yeah. I was so saying, yeah, we, I got to France and, yeah. and it was seven years in France. And we were supposed to actually leave France more or less within months. In fact, I have a letter from the International Rescue Committee sent to my mother saying that your plane tickets are ready. This is the date you're going to leave to go to the United States. And I don't know why, but she decided that she'd had enough of all the traveling around. Maybe she was tired of, of, of maybe she didn't want to rejoin her sister. I don't know. Uh, but what ended up happening was a seven year sojourn in France as Cambodian refugees growing up speaking Did your French. mother speak French? Uh, did your she speak? did not speak French. I mean, she, she went to Catholic school as a little girl for a few years. Maybe they spoke a little bit of French there, but she learned French. She, I just as she learned much better Vietnamese as a result of living uh, two years in Vietnam. Yeah. And I apparently sang Vietnamese communist songs as a little boy right. that I don't know anymore, but it's, a, it's quite amazing. She was able to adapt. And then after seven years in France, reunites with her sister who had by then uh, ended up in, you know, uh, had, had a couple of restaurants in the United States and, and goes to France to visit us and, and sees me and says, I, I look like a, like, a, like, you know, I, I look way too thin and, un, and, you know, malnourished in France, which is quite a, quite a sight to even talk about. But Basically, she says, we need to move and go to, go to, go to the United States. And, and we do in 1985 uh, and uh, live, begin our, our California, our American dream uh, as a result in a new country where now again, my mother has to learn English, which she didn't speak a word of. And I had to learn English and, and then go to school junior high school and high school and, and this was in oakland as i re as i understand right oakland california while sneaking into berkeley unified schools because they yes. were the better schools uh yes. using somebody's borrowed address and um yeah those were the days of which is quite common actually i think in the united states uh, you've got to be entrepreneurial you've got to be you've got to you've got to be street street smart i guess and and my my aunt my aunt was the one, I, I will credit her for that, to say that, you know, you, you can't go to Oakland schools. You, 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 at that time, they were, they were poorly performing and they were dangerous. And so she, she thought, you know, you've got, you, we'll register you in, in Berkeley Unified. And, and they didn't do the whole investigation thing, although I did get found out around my sophomore year in high school. And then I had to get the official paperwork to like legally do it. But 
but it was it was fortuitous. I mean, people nowadays get prosecuted and even possible jail time for doing things like that. And, and indeed, it was so okay. you, you, you didn't really speak English and you get to the United States and you're, you're I know you, uh, you were doing um, English second language courses and then eventually you managed to, uh, you know, get to Berkeley um, to do your yeah. graduate degree. And yeah. even then that was a total miracle because um, frankly, uh, I don't know, if, we've got time, so I'm gonna, I'm, I'll tell you, the, the gist of it, one day, I, my Vietnamese American high school counselor says, you've got, you, there's a meeting up at Berkeley, it's the Center for Southeast Asian Studies is hosting a meeting, go there, skip class. Okay, fine, the counselor says, I can skip class and go to this meeting, I'll go. And there, a man named Bob introduces himself, I don't even know at that point his last name, all I know is his name is Bob, he works in admissions, he writes his phone number on the cover of, an, of a paper application for the University of California. Uh, I, I don't think another thing of it until I get my rejection letter from Berkeley saying, I'm, we're sorry, but you've not been admitted and so on. And then I, I dig up the, now I will say I'm a hoarder when it comes to keeping papers. So I dig up the, the, the application that had his phone number on there, handwritten, and I call up Bob to find out, you know, Bob, what, what should I do? And, I have to say that it was a miracle that I even thought, okay, to find the number, to call him up, to meet with him, and then we devise a plan. He tells me what needs to be done, who to write the letter to, the appeal, and uh, weeks later, a reversal of the decision, I am admitted to Berkeley, and years later, lo and behold, Bob is announced as the new director of admissions at Berkeley. So right. he... He had an inside track all along to knowing exactly what was going on there because yes. he was working in the background as, uh, as somebody who knew, who knew, who knew how the system worked and was an insider. And that, that's, that's the kind of an unbelievable thing that can happen from a chance encounter to multiple other events needing to happen to then end up at Berkeley as a 16 year old incidentally and yeah. not knowing anything really being totally blown by the 30,000 students there. And uh, in fact, uh, you know, if you think about, I mean, I know you mentioned this uh, in your previous talks that, uh, you know, these, these almost these guardian angels, if you will, suddenly appear uh, like that lady who, who trained your mother in Vietnamese, all of these folks who sort of appear at, 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 at these opportune moments. And uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. So. Yeah, no, I, it reminds me that even in high school, of course, I had helpers. I had all these tutors who worked, volunteered as Berkeley undergrads for free at Berkeley Unified School. So one woman, one young lady met me at the cafeteria uh, of the, on the day that I was registering for classes for high school. And she, she looked at my schedule and she said, you're taking ESL, you're taking more English as a second, because I'm entering my freshman year of high school at that point, and she says, don't take any more ESL. You're, you're not gonna be ready for college. You're not gonna have the room to take the classes that you need to actually be admissible to the University of California. And I don't know, for some reason I listened to her. I said, okay. And then the only day I ever saw my mother on Berkeley High's campus or at any event prior to college was on the day she came to apparently sign me out of ESL to officially give the permission that yeah, so Paul Ear does not need to take any more ESL. And of course, it was, it was a total shock to me to take regular English classes and to have to write things known as essays <laughs> right. and, and needing theses yeah. and so on, things that I dare say I don't even know too well, even to this day, but I just keep writing it. I don't know any of the rules. My kids know the rules. <laughs> yes. I just write whether it's, it sounds right, it's, it, it, it'll stay. And then that, of course, I mean, You've done two master's degrees, am I right? Or three, yeah. Three, three master's degrees. So, so in yeah. fact, you've been, you haven't stopped writing ever since. So, no, um, no, indeed. I mean, too overeducated, uh, as or as a PhD, they say permanent head damage. But um, <laughs> it is certainly something that I, I, I don't know. I mean, I was, I was fortunate while in undergrad at Berkeley, I ended up uh, seeing a flyer about a program at. Uh, at various institutes around the, the U.S., but one of them happening in, in Princeton. And so I thought, okay, you know, Princeton is near New York. I always wanted to see New York and, you know, all these sugar plums dancing around your head, thinking about New York City. And so I apply for that. And I also apply for the Berkeley one. And I'm always thinking to myself at that point that 
actually, you know, if I get into both, I'll just do the Berkeley one because it's safe. It's near home. It, it's not far away. And then when I get rejected to the Berkeley Institute and end up getting into the Princeton one, it takes a, a, one of the, the, the lady who, who wrote the letter to admit me, who I thought was a man, incidentally, Wardell Robinson Moore, actually, actually convinces me that it'll be okay. Everything will be fine. You're going to be here. We'll take care of you. You'll stay in a dorm for a few weeks. It'll be great. And I do. And my goodness, it, it's life changing yeah. uh, in terms of experience. And, and then I end up, end up doing my master's at Princeton, the first of, of uh, the first of my first three of three. Yeah. Yeah. And, and exactly. then eventually you did go back to Berkeley to do your PhD. Am I right? I yeah. did. In yeah. fact, yeah. I, I'd been working at the World Bank for three years after Princeton, which was actually a, a, the dream of my, of my life. It was, yeah. um, I remember being asked, uh, one day during that summer institute, hey, where, what do you want to do uh, down the road? And I said, oh, I want to be a governor of the World Bank. And I had no idea what it meant. It meant that I would be, uh, you know, a finance minister for my country because those are the governors of the World yes. Bank technically. And so I didn't even realize it. I just thought, oh, multilateral development institution. Multi you know, it, it just seemed like something to say. And then to have that opportunity when I, finished my, my Princeton master's um, from what was then known as the Woodrow Wilson School, which is now known only as the Princeton School of Public yes. and International Affairs, yes. is, 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 um, is really quite amazing. I mean, I didn't even, I, the, I got the job at the World Bank because um, I had given one of these workshops, volunteered to just do a workshop on how to make web pages, home pages. I had made one back in 94. And so I said, oh, I know how to make it. I'll, I'll come to the computer lab at this time and, and I'll teach you how to make a homepage. And from that, a, uh, a, a student who was graduating when I was in my first year, she was in her second year graduating, remembered. And so when there was a knowledge management opening at the World Bank, she said, hey, so Paul, you know, you'd be right for this because you know all about this web stuff. I didn't know much about it, but <laughs> ended up learning about knowledge man management, ending up learning about social protection, which I had no idea what it was. I'd never heard of the term, but ended up working on social protection and doing all and these. Then, and then as I understand it, when you did your, well, I, I, I don't know where you fit in the other two master's degrees, but you eventually got to doing your PhD work and you went to work for the UNDP. Yes, and yes. I believe in Timor-Leste and places That's like that. That's right. I was so, in fact there at, in New York when they hoisted the flag of Timor Leste up as a the newest member of the United Nations, and and it was it was it, it was quite a, a feeling to see how countries become members of the UN. The 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 fact that you know I could help a country that didn't exist uh, a, a year earlier uh, through its journey with with democratic governance, which was my area. Um, so UNDP was, was, was a fascinating experience. I used to play tennis on the, uh, on the, the dilapidated tennis court of the governor's compound, which is now the home of the U.S. ambassador and I think the U.S. embassy as well. And so it, it was just one of these things. You, you, you're there to witness history almost. Yeah. And that's where you really, I guess, you absorbed all this sort of on the ground experience and knowledge about nation building and, and what it really takes to develop not just sort of the ideas of citizenship and nationhood, but also how do you develop a democracy in many ways from scratch? And, and, and that must have been really quite fascinating. All right. And how uh, sometimes dangerous that period is for countries, right? You've got if you if you've come out of conflict and you bring in elections immediately, you can unleash the dogs of war, as um, has been said. And those those are the that's the the kind of the analogy I use in, to my students is it's like criminal recidivism. You you have a likelihood of returning back to to that conflict state. And so uh, during the time that I was in Timor, there was the Bali bombing. And then there were the riots that happened. Um, thankfully, not uh, the one where uh, the uh, then president was shot in the stomach. I was already gone from Timor then. But you can see that, the, that when you can't deal with the root causes of the conflict, 
they will come back. So you, there's a term called negative peace. Negative peace is when the root causes haven't been dealt with. You have peace, you have the succession of fighting, but you don't actually have the true beginnings of positive peace, yeah. which is the, the, the issues have been dealt with. There's reconciliation. That's which like, is sustainable because that's the kind of peace that would be sustainable. Now, do you see in Southeast Asia this kind of recidivism, this kind of, I mean, backsliding, I guess, another term. Mm. Uh, I mean, you've talked a bit about it in the context of Cambodia. Yeah. Uh, but um, are, it, it, what does it say about the different polities in Southeast Asia. I mean, people talk these days about Thailand. I mean, we've seen sure. recent demonstrations I mean, in Thailand. Right? Years, decade, you know, it, it doesn't seem like that long ago. Thailand would have been seen as the shining beacon of the possibility of, of democracy in Southeast Asia. You had had successive democratic governments elected and, and, and prime ministers, certainly no coups and so on. And then on the other hand, you, you had Indonesia, which was, you know, torn apart with protests all the time, and now the, a complete reversal in that sense. So you, you, you've got that. Um, you, you had a, literally a prime minister, Abbasid, at one point saying, you know, elections are anti-democratic, which is, what, what is that supposed to mean exactly? Um, but the, the point being is that those who have power do not want to give it up through a process that they think is going to lead to them losing. Um, and, uh, and you've seen that, of course, in, in, in Myanmar, where you know, the person that you thought was going to lead the country towards eternal salvation and peace ends up actually being a normal politician who will play on all kinds of possible ethnic issues to gain votes. Uh, she knows full well that it's, it's, it's the way that, that, that one gets elected one stays in power but unfortunately it is also resulting in terrible terrible uh genocidal acts which which have to be stopped now uh you look at the backsliding that has happened it's it's there also in the philippines your uh, uh i assume you were born there alejandro yes uh, it's certainly uh, i think another example of Wow, populism, strongman populism being uh, uh, very attractive to, to, to the segment of the population that maybe has been tired of crime and, and drugs and, and, and latches on to, uh, to a figure that they believe might be, uh, might be able to, to stop that. But of course, there's a price to be paid. The media is silenced. People are being killed who aren't actually proven uh, who haven't gotten their day in court and are simply executed. It's a price that I think is far too large to pay for a, a country with the democratic origins or at least the, the, the institutions that the Philippines has had and continues, hopefully, to enjoy. But you, you, know, you mentioned Indonesia, and interestingly, I guess Indonesia is, it, it could be that shining city on the hill kind of thing. Right, right. Yeah, and, in a way. And exactly. I mean, it's it's got some contradictions. Obviously, yes. uh, Joko has has not has not is not perfect in the sense of you know consistently standing up for what's right. I mean, there are situations where it's very very clearly political in terms of decisions about things, in terms of who gets prosecuted, who gets harassed, and so on. But uh, it, yeah, it, there's more hope certainly in Indonesia being an example of democracy than, 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 than Thailand at the moment. Now, you've been an Occidental since 2014. Um, and so I, I guess you've almost, in some ways, naturally gravitated towards the education profession uh, because you're so well educated at this point with, your, with all these degrees. Um, with some irony, I should say, because I, I do call myself the accidental professor at Occidental because <laughs> I never meant to be a professor. In fact, I even told Berkeley when I was doing my PhD that I didn't need to teach uh, or to be a teaching assistant which is a requirement of getting your PhD because I would never become an academic. No, never, no possibility of that. And of course, what's the first thing I do out of my PhD but become a postdoc 
who teaches at the Maxwell School of Syracuse University yeah. and tortures his students because I have no idea what I'm doing at that point. And, uh, <laughs> right. and, and I'm, I'm, I learned thanks to them and I, 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 I apologize for what I did to them uh, in, in learning that, in that learning process. But you're, you're right. I mean, it, it, I, in the sense that I never meant to, really, I, I didn't. And I, I stumbled into it because I was supposed to be you know, you're an international bureaucrat that works at the UN, at the World Bank. I interviewed so many times at ADB and the IMF on their panels and so on for their young professional, young economist, this and that. And in the end, it, was, it wasn't meant to be because um, my advisor said, you've got three years after your PhD to get an academic job. Otherwise, you'll be considered too outdated in your knowledge. To, to, to become an academic. Um, and so I thought, oh, I actually believed him literally and said, okay, <laughs> right. I will go into, like, I will try it. And then, um, you know, even for the Maxwell School, that was, that, it was a miracle. I, I didn't think I'd have a shot, but apparently the uh, professor, uh, Jeremy Schiffman, whose position I kind of, he went on sabbatical that year to the Center for Global Development read my uh, cover letter. I talked about being a Cambodian refugee, et cetera. And he, I don't know, he, he had something where he understood the struggles uh, and he, he and, 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 and um, his dean at the time said, okay, well, we'll give him a chance. And, and so I ended up yes. getting my first shot without any interview or anything like that because it was just a postdoc thing and, you know. Now, um, tell us a bit about your research in, uh, in this forthcoming book. Um, what sort of work are you doing? And this book, uh, as I uh, mentioned, the title is Viral Sovereignty and the Political Economy of Pandemics. What explains how countries deal with outbreaks, which is just being so incredibly timely. It's like you know, this book, as you, you mentioned to me earlier, was it is, uh, 10 years in the making or whatever, but yeah. I mean, the fact that it, it, this is the moment for this book. And so I know. I know. I, it's, it's, it's one of those things. It's like I said, uh, you know, even a broken clock can be right twice a day. I, I've somehow managed to, to strike at the time where, yeah, we've just hit another, this, the, we get two or three pandemics per century and the timing couldn't be better. Um, now, so the, the, the idea of viral sovereignty, which is the, in the title of the book is one that Indonesia gave us. Uh, back when avian influenza was the uh, main concern about, you know, is this going to become a, um, a, its own sort of pandemic? Uh, it thankfully never became that. It, it, it was definitely very, very deadly. And so perhaps it killed so effectively that it didn't get the time. It didn't transmit from human to human uh, effectively. Uh, but viral sovereignty was this idea that uh, the then health minister of Indonesia uh, Siti Fardela Supari introduced to the world where she argued that viruses were the intellectual property of countries in which they are found and therefore cannot be taken out without the permission of the country, the government, because like flora and fauna, and she used the, the flora and fauna convention as a basis for this argument, viruses were somehow the property, therefore not to be removed and tested and, and have vaccines created. And, and she, it wasn't that she was anti-science. No, she, was, she actually was arguing that countries like Indonesia, which didn't have the technology to produce their own vaccine, needed to have the leverage of the actual virus, the viral isolate, to negotiate with Baxter Pharmaceuticals and other, other uh, you know, uh, pharmaceuticals to, to essentially say, okay, well, if we give this to you, you need to give us a vaccine at a reasonably low price because we helped you. Um, of course, it's a danger when a country doesn't share uh, viral isolates, when it doesn't uh, participate in the international health regulation of the World Health Organization. That is the fear that uh, countries would allow uh, a virus to spread uh, un, in, unhindered without, you know, this is the kind of argument China makes in, the, in that it says, you know, WHO, you can't come in. You, you have to get permission from us to send a mission to our country and investigate the origins of, of, uh, of the coronavirus. Um, it, they don't call it viral sovereignty, but it's clearly the argument that the sovereignty of the country uh, trumps any 
right to you know come in and investigate things and and do things willy nilly and is it a danger of course it's a danger china does have the technology in that they can make the vaccine and they are making uh, putting on uh, various uh, phases of of their vaccine trials already so so that's not the the basis of not letting people in that's about regime survival that's about keeping the uh, uh, chinese communist party at arm's length in terms of blame for what happened in Wuhan. Um, in Mexico, uh, I study the case of, uh, of swine flu, H1N1, the last pandemic we had in this century, which uh, came out in 2009, and, and how Mexico reacted. And uh, it was actually at a um, World Economic Forum meeting on Latin America that took place in Puerto Vallarta, where at the time, um, uh, the, 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 the president uh, of Mexico spoke to, to, the, to young global leaders like myself about that incident. He said that uh, essentially it was like one of these 3 a.m. phone calls where he's told, you know, there's, a, there's, there's been an outbreak of an unknown uh, uh, influenza virus and what should we do? Should we, should we keep it under tabs, uh, under, under wraps, or should we uh, reveal to the world the problem and be transparent about it? And he actually made the decision that Mexico would be transparent about it, would, would share what it knows, would allow the US, the CDC to come in to take samples. The Canadians also helped uh, tremendously. And, and so, um, so these are the different kinds of reactions of how countries handle outbreaks. Was it because Mexico borders the US and therefore cannot, could not have hidden it too long because of the amount of trans boundary travel that happens or is it because you had a government a president who was who was more open to the idea of transparency than the current one amlo who apparently argued that you know it is in the mexican nature to embrace and we're not going to be stopped from embracing even during covid and, and of course the deaths start to pile up and it's time to actually do something about it but remember how mexico had all the social distancing, they, they pioneered this. And it's kind of amazing that in the second, in the more serious outcome of, you know, with COVID as a pandemic, they, they totally didn't want to go down that road. Maybe it was because they already experienced the economic costs of, of swine flu and how it took 1% of their GDP during the last global recession, which ended up doing a total of 5.5% on their GDP. But they, uh, they didn't want to go down that road. It may end up being a very, very big mistake uh, from the standpoint of the number of lives lost um, the, uh, and the cost of the human toll. Now, as, as somebody who's, you, you, you studied um, examples of genocide, uh, particularly, of course, in Cambodia, and now we have the pandemic. That, does the pandemic suggest that the, the concept of re the responsibility to protect, R2P, which has been accepted as a norm in international relations, that it's far too limiting. Now, many people say R2P is dead because we've had the Libya and Syria and the, the differentials and how it was invoked in one and not in the other. Um, and, and that you know nobody is, is going to support R2P anymore going forward. But I would argue, and I don't know how you feel about this, that a pandemic suggests that if there's a country that's not um, fulfilling its obligations to its own citizens and allowing citizens to come in harm's way by either ignoring a pandemic or suppressing information, that this might suggest a, a situation where an R2P intervention may be required. But then, of course, that's not within the very narrow focus of R2P. Well, you know, it's actually already been used. Uh, it was used in the case of Cyclone Nargis. Uh, and it's well, they tried to, right? With Cy they tried to. Bernard Kushner, Bernard the, Kushner tried yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He yes. tried to invoke it as a reason for... But it failed. But that failed. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But I think, I think, generally speaking, if a country fails to uphold the protection of its citizens, that ought to be the basis of not necessarily intervention immediately, because after all, R2P has multiple pillars and it's the responsibility to prevent, it's the responsibility to protect, and it's the responsibility to rebuild. 
Um, but I would say that, uh, you know, if anything, the argument could be used that the U.S. has had something like 146,000 excess deaths than what a normal performing uh, government should have uh, resulted in, in terms of number of, of deaths out of COVID and that it is, in fact, one of the, the worst performing uh, in terms of number of, of deaths. So therefore, is the U.S., for example, not the, the government not doing its share to protect its own citizens? And who would intervene in that case? And there I say it. I mean, with any international law, it always comes down to whoever has the guns and whoever has the ability and the might does what they need to do or want to do. And when they don't want to do it, then nothing gets done. So, you know, there is no Leviathan. Uh, that's why we have a kind of, um, uh, you know, this, this international politics is really about the anarchic society and not somebody's in charge. Them. If, 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 if we have a world sheriff, then who is he exactly in that case? And that's, that speaks to the R2P dilemma, doesn't it? So the order is the disorder in some way. All right. Well, it, it, it is really a, a situation where, uh, where the resources, uh, whether it's the weapons or the gold, uh, uh, are the, the basis of, of action. And as you well know from many meetings at the WEF, uh, it's cynically said that the golden rule is, in fact, whoever has the gold makes the rules. And we see that happening uh, now more than ever in terms of China calling the shots, having the resources with BRI, with uh, an economy that appears to have already weathered the storm. In fact, they're probably asking what, what outbreak, what is that? We're, we're living our lives normally and the rest of the world is still suffering in uh, shutdowns. Now, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm aware that we're uh, now closing time, getting close to time and um, uh, so I just want to ask you about the pandemic. I've been asking all our contributors, you know, how have you been doing and your family been doing through the pandemic? You are teaching already. The uh, classes have resumed at Occidental, uh, but I, I, get, I take it that you're uh, always on Zoom teaching. This and, is my um, classroom. Yes, <laughs> it's your classroom. My bedroom. Yeah. My and, bedroom. And, so, and now you have uh, concerns about, you, you mentioned to me on email, your concerns about a twindemic having the flu and COVID-19 at the same time. So what's it like on campus? Are students back? And how is your teaching going? And your family, well, how are you coping? There, there was magical thinking for much of the summer in terms of uh, believing that somehow we would be able to return to campus in May and in June. That was the line. And by July, early July, it became clear that nobody, first of all, even if the students returned to campus or a fraction thereof, the faculty was refusing to appear in person in, in the classroom. Uh, so every, so it, would, it was going to be this kind of false advertising where okay, well, you, you know, we invite you back on campus, but actually all your classes will be done remotely while you're sitting in your dorm room. Well, they got the message that basically it would be better to stop the magical thinking and to say, well, we're going to actually just go remote. You know, let's not proceed with the plan to bring people back. After all, it, it would have cost us millions to do all the testing and all the uh, personal protective equipment purchasing that was required to actually accommodate in-person um, students on campus, never mind faculty on campus, but we, they were showing classrooms, you know, building tents outside so you could teach outside. Well, oh, it's right. kind of <laughs> hot out here. Uh, it, it's going to be difficult. And then, you know, yeah. how are you going to do your PowerPoint slides and so on? It's, it was a challenge, but, but so we're all, we're all online at this point. Everybody's at home where, Really, it's safer. Um, as a result, uh, they're not doing the partying that some of the campuses in the United States that have returned to in-person, um, whether instruction or in-person uh, students meeting each other. And how are you going to tell students that college life isn't about socializing, isn't about partying? That's what they pay for. That's what their parents pay for. And yes. that's how they raise money when they, you know, <laughs> right. when Princeton launches, you know, a hundred thousand dollars of fireworks in the, in the air at reunions. It's about getting those tiers and those checkbooks open so that they can get, you know, all these donations that are, that, that make the university so incredibly 
well off and the students so well off as a result. But the reality is that, you know, we have to be prepared. And so I took the whole family right before this interview, in fact, uh, to get our flu shots because I knew the, uh, the flu vaccine has already yeah. been released. And, and I don't want a situation where uh, because of the flu, never mind the, uh, the, the coronavirus, we would end up being sick uh, and then having to go to the hospital or clogging up emergency rooms and so on, resources that are scarce already for those who need, need, you know, need, need ventilators and, and, and critical care and to take care of that. And, you know, that's, that's, that's really uh, the being prepared in that situation is, is, is the most we can do. And, and the kids, they're all doing remote learning. So they're uh, 8, 20 a.m. or kids on computers, talking to their teachers, getting zoomed out just like I am from hours and hours of staring at screens. But we won't, we certainly won't get coronavirus from a computer, uh, from staring at a computer. We might get migraines though, but that's, that's just the reality of and the situation of, in uh, LA is uh, up and down as I understand it. It's right. Been... So it was, it was terrible uh, only uh, weeks ago. It's now becoming uh, better and we're soon, I think going to be below 200 cases per hundred thousand, which is, the uh, the cutoff for uh, for getting off the watch list and and actually dimming the switch to uh, to reopening some activity like hair salons and so on indoors, uh, but yeah, I mean I think I think that with a county of ten million people, this is a place where you can, you just cannot take it for granted. I mean the mo the next holiday, uh, Labor Day in the United States is September seventh, Monday literally, you know, next week is going to be, I think, another test where 14 days from that day, we're going to have an, a, a spike again, because people are going to get together on Labor Day, they're going to do their barbecues, and they're going to transmit the virus. And then they're going to, they're going to find this out within two weeks, and, and, and the numbers are going to change again. And, and by then, we'll hit you know, the fall, uh, autumn season and, um, and the flu will be in full swing. And that's when we really have to worry about uh, a return to the kinds of numbers that we've seen in the past. So we such hope as for the is, best. Indeed. Yeah. Anyway, so far, it's been fantastic. You've been very generous with your time. We've gone way over what I was, uh, My pleasure. What I had, how I had uh, sold it to you. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much for sharing your experience, your thoughts, and, in terms, and, and indeed your, your really epic story, especially uh, about your, your mother's heroic efforts to, to get her family uh, through from Vietnam to France to to uh, the United States. It's, it's pretty amazing. A pleasure. So, yes. So thank you again. And uh, thank you. best wishes uh, as you uh, start the school year and get through the, the fall and, the, and, and, and all the risks that we're facing. Indeed. Thank you, Alejandro. Cheers. Thanks very Bye. much. Thanks.